Hello, Leo. This is Kathy Hambrick, the founder of the River Road African American Museum. It's been a long time since I talked to you and your family. But we're trying to be safe during this COVID season. And I just have a few questions for you. And thank you so much for doing this interview with me. Question number one. You told me once that you have family from Donisonville. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? My uh, grandfather and his two brothers, grandfather Archie Nochentella, they came from, uh, actually they were, the, the, the mom, his mom and dad were born in, in, a, in a town near Palermo, Sicily. And, and uh, they moved the family to uh, a, a little town named, um, called Montembano, which is in northern Italy. Mm. So um, they came down from there and they became migrated to, to Louisiana and they, they moved, uh, they migrated to a town called Donaldsonville. I don't know why, why they picked Donaldsonville, but that's where they came, the three brothers. Uh, Gustav, Arstein, and Ricardo. My dad was one of nine children that they had. Uh, my, you know, my, my grandfather, he, they were well, they were well to do. They had, you know, had money. They were considered white Italians. From then, uh, my dad, you know, I, I remember going out there, my dad taking us out there to meet his sister. They had nine, nine, he had nine sisters and brothers. And uh, we used to go out there like almost every week to meet, to, to just to hang out and to meet and be with his sisters. And uh, I remember going out there specifically. Uh, well, my daddy, he, he was quite a prominent guy in, in Downsville. He had a band called Louisiana Black Devil Band. So he was kind of popular there. And I didn't know how popular he was until later. But uh, one, thing that, one thing that sticks out to me is that I remember as a kid, a state fair every year that they gave in Donaldsonville, and uh, and I used to go every week. It was, I think it was like two weekends or something like that. But the significance of that week of the two weekends was that they had a one day was for whites and one day was for blacks. So we could only go on the day that the blacks uh, was allowed to go see the fair. So uh, I didn't think about about it then. It was nothing because I was a kid, maybe ten or twelve years old. But you know, when I, when I got as I got old, I, I start thinking about it. Wow, that was a strange time then, you know, compared compared to now. But um, Donaldsonville is a the very uh, rich rich little rich little town. You know, um, uh, I know it very well. They used to stay on. Uh, as a matter of fact, I don't remember the address. It was nine twenty three Elizabeth Street in Donaldsonville near the near the railroad tracks and. Uh, Donaldsonville was one of my favorite places to go as a kid. Um, yeah, I used to go well, out as a kid, you know, every, every, from curiosity, I used to go jump on the railroad track and throw rocks at each other and, and uh, just play up and down the track. Even though they were trained, running trains then, mm -hmm. uh, I think it was at the, right at the end of Elizabeth Street, if I'm not mistaken, uh, was in walking distance of my, uh, my auntie's house. And uh, I don't even know, I don't know if the railroad track is still there. I think it is. I think the railroad track was there. But um, it, it just was a, it was a fun time growing up as a kid, going out there, even though it was, it was uh, segregation and the whole bit. And uh, it, it just, it just was, I, I remember one is my, my, evidently my grandfather and my grandmother, they, they had some money because I remember how I used to, I remember, uh, one of my aunties used to ask me, say, look, go, go across the street at the store and go get a loaf of bread. And, and, the, and, the, and when I used to go over there, I just, they used to give me the bread and I used to go, just to leave. And now I know why they, I didn't have to never pay for it because they owned the grocery store. So, they, you know, they, they were well to do, so to speak. And uh, uh, it, just, it just was a, it was, it was a fun time. My, my, my aunties was out there, but they all had houses. And we just used to go out there, play marbles, play tops. And, you know, you might find within a family, you might find maybe maybe 15, 20 members of the family. Like my cousin would come out and they would all go to Downsonville at my auntie's house. You know, my mother relative, related relative. And we did we, that cooking. Uh, just, just food. And uh, there was another place. 
on my mom's side, it's called La Plaza. She's from La Plaza. And uh, we used to go out there every week, you know, split, go off and on each weekend. And I, the one thing I remember about that, they, had, they used to cook. My mom had three, had two sisters. They used to cook so good. And we'd go out there, and uh, in the evening, we'd sit down and eat like a, like a full course meal, like rice, peas, and smothered chicken, and I mean everything, greens. But the significance of the thing, the significance of that was, they cooked all that on one wood burning stove. Just with one, 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 one thing. They cooked all that food. They would cook. They would start early in the morning. They would cook the pot of rice. They would put that aside. Then they would take and, and do the smothered chicken. Then once that's done, they would take and put that aside. Then they would take another pot and put the, the green peas. And it, so you'd have maybe about three different things they would do on this one wood burning stove. One stove. And when the end result was, the end result was. They had a full course meal, but it took all day to do it, and that was that was that was beautiful. I, you know, I, I just realized when I mean, didn't realize how significant that was and how beautiful that was until I got older and said, "Wow, they they went out there and cooked that whole full course meal on one wood burning stove." Jack Nocentelli, yeah, Nocentelli, that was his name. His sister's name Irene, Ida, his brother Alex, uh, brother Percy. Um, Sylvia, you know, I remember coming. I remember coming up as a kid and meeting them very briefly. They had two houses out there on Elizabeth, on Elizabeth Street. I met them very briefly because they were old when I was coming up, and you know they died off. Uh, uh, but I got I got to know them, and they got to know me, and um, it, it, it was it was a close knit family. It wasn't it wasn't anything that I could think to say. Well, I don't remember that. I remember exactly uh, that that time. I was old enough to remember my dad's uh, immediate family. Question number two that I have for you is do you think that that has had an impact on your music over the years? I can see this. This is a bass player. His name was, uh, we used to call him Spring. We call him Spring now, okay? Uh, this was Hawk, a trumpet player, was one of my mentors. He used to take me around, man, all the time. And this is Betsy here. She used to be the lead the singer for the Danny White. The name of this band is Danny White and the Cavaliers. He had a song called Long Me Handkerchief and Kiss Tomorrow Goodbye, which was really big regional regional songs. Regional song, rather. And uh, this is Herbert Hollister, Lawrence Cotton, who is 93 now. 93, you know. Him, Seth O'Reilly. This is Nolan Coleman there. Nolan is still alive. Nolan is 78. And this is me. I was like 17 years old uh, when I was when I was right before I went to the army. But that was the band back then. And it's, it's a weird look looking at me like that as, as a 17 year old kid playing with all these all these musicians. They were giants. I mean, they were like some of the top musicians in in the in, in the city of New Orleans. And here I am, a little 17 year old guy. I just had enough talent to play with those guys. So I was blessed to, to have that kind of talent. Danny White and the Cavaliers. I was maybe about eight years old. And uh, my dad used to take me out. And uh, one time he brought me to a store called Woolworths, which was a very kind of department store here at the back of the game. And uh, I, he's, he, he, I saw this little toy ukulele. It was $2.98. It had four plastic strings on it. And it was really a toy. But uh, the thing about it, and he bought it for me, and uh, when, immediately when I when I picked it up, I just started playing, picking out melodies of songs that was on the radio because I used to listen to the radio as a young kid. I mean, and I just started picking it out without without anybody showing me anything, just looking at the the, the the neck of the ukulele and pressing on the string and trying to figure out what's the next note to play that would be uh, that would be the next note that I hear the way the song, the way the melody of the song went. And um, from there, you know, I just, my dad saw, my dad saw a, a great interest in me, uh, me uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a music person, as a talent. And uh, he, he saw fit to 
to buy me other instruments, to buy me uh, other guitars. You know, it was a six string guitar he bought me. I had to figure out what to do with the other two strings because the ukulele only had four. So I finally did that just, you know, through the tenacity and, and, um, and wanting to uh, learn the instrument. I just kept on at it, you know, through, through all the years up until this very, up until this very moment. And I think, you know, as musicians, if, if you are, you are a well, a well versed musician, you know, you go through that. You just keep, keep on doing it, keep on doing it, keep on doing it, keep on doing it until you, uh, until you get to a point where you could, where when people hear you, hear you play, you please them. Then you know, you maybe accomplish something. Yeah. When, you know, when I came, I, I, when I came to Donaldsonville, I was really trying to find my, my dad's, my dad's grave, believe it or not. Because when he was buried, he didn't have a, a headstone. And I was trying to see about getting a headstone and trying to find out exactly, and putting a headstone by his grave, where, where, where we were no way that. So I went to the, uh, to the city hall. They gave me, they didn't have any records of exactly where the grave was, which I couldn't understand why. They gave me an idea. So I have an idea now of where the actual grave plot is. And uh, I'm going to eventually go out there and uh, buy his stone for my dad, you know, where he could be known for, his, for the people that's his descendants, where they know where, where he's at. I really, that's something I have to do. Uh, I remember the River Road African Museum, they put out some records, they were kind enough to pull out some records for me and help me try to find some location. And, I, and then from that, I found out a lot of other things. When a lot of my other ancestors that I didn't even know about, they came over in the ship. You know, along with my grandfather that I, I had no idea was with them. I don't recall the names right now, but if I go out there at the museum, I'm pretty sure they still have the records of every, everybody uh, there. So uh, it was very essential. It was very essential to me to, uh, it did help me a lot trying to find my people. And question number three, would you play a little something for me? I'll be glad to, be glad to play something. I'm gonna have my, my younger brother here, Angelo, to come play this with me, uh, a song I wrote called Fire in the Body that was recorded by the media.
Actually, we started doing it just as a joke on a bandstand when we played with the meters, and Zig started coming up with the, with the with the basic idea of, of that uh, of that song, and he just started incorporating. It was it was a, it was a melody that was taken from another source, but uh, we started interpreting it as like the the, the animals at the Audubon Zoo, you know, the monkey's ass, the tiger's ass, and the elephant's ass, me too. So it's just an interpretation of another idea that we interpreted uh, directed to the, the animals that was in the Audubon Zoo. Oh, really? If I can remember, because I never sung it, so I might say the bee's ass. Okay, all <laughs> or, right, that's okay. Or the snake's ass, okay. I don't know, so just forgive me. Hey, okay. that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. 